Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Today we're going to uh, read Psalm 66. Make a joyful noise unto God, all ye lands. Spring, sing forth the honor of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say unto God, How terrible art thou in thy works. Through the greatness of thy power shall thine enemies submit themselves unto thee. All the earth shall worship thee, and shall sing unto thee, they shall sing to thy name, Selah. Come and see the works of God, he is terrible in his doing toward the children of men. He turned the sea into dry land. They went through the flood on foot, there did we rejoice in him. He ruleth by his power forever, his eyes behold the nations. Let not the rebellious exalt themselves, Selah. O oh, bless our God, ye people, and make the voice of his praise to be heard, which holdeth our soul in life, and suffereth not our feet to be moved. For thou, O God, hast proved us, thou hast tried us, as silver is tried. Thou broughtest us into the net, thou laidest affliction upon our loins. Thou hast caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water. But thou broughtest us out into a wealthy place. I will go into thy house with burnt offerings. I will pay thee my vows, which my lips have uttered, and my mouth hath, hath spoken when I was in trouble. I will offer unto thee burnt sacrifices of fatlings with the incense of rams. I will offer bullocks with goats, selah. Come and hear, all ye that fear God, and I will declare what he hath done for my soul. I cried unto him with my mouth, and he was extolled with my tongue. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. But verily God hath heard me. He hath attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, which hath not turned away my prayer, nor has mercy on me. Amen. <clears throat> so, uh, making comments here about the first verse, it says, Make a joyful noise unto God, all ye lands. Here the instruction is to make a joyful noise unto God. Thus the purpose is for people, no matter which country one finds himself in, to make joyful noises unto God. And what is the purpose for this? Why? Why? Why does the writer state that all ye lands, since he was writing from Israel, and he was only writing as a person in one country or one nation, and the other nations around the world, they had worshipped their own God. So why would he write it like this? Well, it was inspired by God, obviously, but also... It's an expectation that Israel at that time was a light to the other nations. That they should make a joyful noise unto God. They should worship God as they knew him. But today, obviously, this stands more true that more people around the world are actually making a joyful noise unto God. And by the time that Jesus comes back, there will be People from every nation worshiping or loving him and making a joyful noise unto God. What are joyful noises unto God? The answer to that lies in the singing, the worship, the prayer, the praise, um, and playing of musical instruments, what have you. All for the purpose of glorifying God in one way or another. There may be many other ways to worship unto God, but the fact is, it should be joyful. And it should come from every single land or every tongue or every people. This means that no matter where, when, or from what race or color of people, the lands throughout the world should be making joyful praises unto God. And so the question might be asked, why would this be recommended for all lands in every country to have a joyful noise unto God? My perception is that the reason is for the benefit that they will receive because they 
praise God. God, you know, does um, so many things while we are praising Him, while we are praying to Him, while we are glorifying Him. There's something that happens in the spiritual realm, and more blessings come to us as a result. So when uh, all the lands of the earth begin to praise God, there is a blessing that's going to flow through to them from to the, the to those lands from heaven, and uh, it's a uh, a way to break the down the the power of the enemy and to glorify God, the real the one and true God that is alive and well, and He is the one who created everyone. And he deserves that praise and that glorification. But that, uh, when people do that, when people begin to worship God from every every nation of the world, then there is a spiritual blessing and also a blessing in many different ways, spiritually, physically, mentally, what have you. Amen. My perception is for that reason, because there is a blessing. There are many blessings that can come. Having the joyful noise into God coming from all lands is for that purpose, for the blessing of God just to flow, the Spirit of God to flow. Amen. Today, people can receive the Spirit of God. And when that joyful uh, noise is brought up before God, and then in church buildings and places of where people congregate to worship God for that purpose, uh, people can feel the Spirit of God today, whereas in the past they couldn't. But today, they can feel the power and the presence of God. So there's more blessings that happen and that occur when people make that joyful noise unto God. So that just means that God is moving through the land, that prayers are being answered, the blessings are flowing, the people are getting their heavenly help, People are getting comfort in their soul. People are getting exactly what they really need and not what they just want. Praise the Lord. Or what they, they, they're getting what they want to, not just what they need, how they put it that way. So one may say that where does this noise ascend up to, this joyful noise? When we praise the Lord, it goes up into heaven and... Uh, you know, before Jesus Christ, he is glorified before all the angels in heaven. They are watching all this glorification go up from uh, from earth. And, uh, of course, at the beginning, the, the angels were the ones who were praising God. And only the angels did that. But as the population of the earth got bigger and bigger and as time went on, now there is... There, there is a lot of praise coming from the earth, and it is going up, and uh, and that is the whole reason why Jesus Christ came, was to bring mankind to salvation, and also have him realize that what a wonderful God we serve, and he deserves, and he is worthy of the praise. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So... The praise and this joyful noise goes up to heaven's throne, and Jesus receives this praise. It proceeds all the way up to the throne of God as prayer, as prayers do, worship does, and then from those who are truly His. The term is not just noise, for when one says noise, one kind of gets a negative picture, a negative connotation. In the King James Version, parts of these, this particular psalm it, uh, sounds kind of negative. That means the, the meaning of the words have changed over time, but actually this obviously is a positive thing. So back then it was positive. Today, um, a lot of people think those kind of expressions are negative, but it's it's the fact that it's a positive. So joyful, and that word joyful puts it into the positive light. So there is the word joyful added to the word noise, which obviously means that the it is a positive connotation. It's positive. It's something good that God is is receiving up in heaven. Amen. 
And it's for the throne of God, for God himself, Jesus Christ. It's not an unpleasant noise, but it is one that God himself is very pleased with. The angels, too, are, yes, overjoyed that the worship is not just coming from them, but that others are joining in. Mankind is joining in. And it's coming from the earth, not just heaven, it's coming from the earth. And uh, from all people of the world, around around the world, nations are beginning to, uh, more and more people are beginning to worship the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. So they're taking part in the praise and worship to Jesus Christ. And the more pleasing it is to God, the more he will bless the land or the country or the people to whom or from whom this joyful noise is being sent up. Amen. That said, it should be then the goal for more joyful noise to be sent up to heaven. For the purpose of glorification of Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, that is what will please him and that is what will satisfy not only Jesus, but it'll satisfy us. When we praise Jesus Christ, we become satisfied. That is the glorious thing because, you know, uh, we are giving praise and honor and glory to him. And pretty soon we're satisfied in our spirit. You know, if our spirit was feeling a little bit mm, down, a little bit bitter, a little bit of this and that, of the mm, feelings that are negative, we begin to praise God, we worship God, and all those negative things kind of leave and fade out and go away. And Jesus Christ is exalted, and his comfort, his peace, his forgiveness, his love, all of this comes into the heart of the one who is worshiping Jesus Christ. That is what will please him, and that is what will satisfy Jesus Christ and his people. It's like a, you know, a, a, an agreement. Hallelujah. Both get satisfied. Instead of something bad that God would send, no, he sends those things that are good. He sends the blessing. He sends, you know, the, the help in time of need. Hallelujah, and especially when it's pleasing in his sight. Amen. That is the wonderful thing about God. He does care for his people, and he does enjoy the worship that people do, his people. Sing forth the honor of his name. Make his praise glorious. Amen. So there is then the fact that there should be a joyful noise being sent up to God. But also there should be singing that should come forth to God's throne high above. Sing forth, amen, the honor of his name. Sing. Praise the Lord. Um, in another way to look at it, the name of the Lord should be given plenteous honor high and above. We know that name to be the name of Jesus, the Lord God of heaven and earth. He is to be praised. He is, that name is to be honored throughout the uh, world, throughout the universe. Amen. The name of the Lord Jesus Christ should be given plenteous honor high and above. And there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It has to be the name of Jesus and that is the highest name. It is the most glorious name. Praise that name. Sing Forth the honor of that name, for it is that name, that saving name. Amen. So Jesus Christ merits praise, the praises of his people, the honor of his name being exalted on high. So what is coming from verse number two, it says, make his praise glorious. You know, there is a praise, maybe uh, early in the morning on a Sunday morning, you don't feel that kind of... Uh, unction to get going and praising the Lord. But here is an encouragement from the psalmist. He says, make the pra his praise glorious. Amen. So the praise coming from the people of God should be glorious towards him. Make it that way. That's what it's encouraging us to do. The fact of the matter is the people of God should make that praise glorious glorious for that is what is being requested by the you know psalmist here for the people of god 
And that way, others can see the light that is in us. And in fact, the, the, when we do make his praise glorious, that is when the more blessings come forth, amen, from the th throne of God. There it seems to be attending to the fact that the people of God should be instructed in this. There should be instruction in how to praise God in a way to give him glory, to attend to the praise of God. And so it, it is a special thing, more important, hallelujah, than, you know, the things of the world is to give praise to God, to attend to praise God is to give a high honor to him and his, his name, his power, who he is, and then say, hey, he is more important than the things of this world. My praise goes up to him, and it, it is from deep within my heart, and I appreciate him more than anything else. Amen. He is the ruler of the heavens and the earth. Therefore, the praise going unto him should be considered carefully and given from the people of God their utmost. That is to have the people of God make the praise glorious and not just something that is, quote unquote, run of the mill. Thus from everywhere that is the goal in mind to set upon the fact that the people of God make a pray, a joyful noise unto God, amen. Or one can compare, you know, how that the people uh, uh, go to a soccer game and there is a, 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 a rival match and uh, people are excited. The, the game is, there's a lot of expectation and people are shouting, etc. And if you look at that and you compare it to the way that the people of the Lord uh, worship God, God wants more praise than that. God wants, uh, so uh, here uh, the Bible is instructing us to make his praise glorious. In other words, it should be better than any other thing that comes from this earth, you know. So our praise should be really on fire for God, exciting, and it would draw people to the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse number three, it says, Say unto God, how terrible art thou in thy works. Through the greatness of thy power shall thine enemies submit themselves unto thee. So here again, this is kind of like the King James Version. Uh, how terrible art thou in thy works. If we were to say that in the meaning today, it's almost sounding like a negative connotation. However, uh, the truth is, this is saying it in a positive light. How wonderful, you could say, or how beautiful, or how awesome, how uh, great art thou in thy works. And the works of the Lord are his creation, the miracles that he does, and etc. And uh, through the greatness of thy power shall thine enemies submit themselves unto thee. So here, in taking what the writer of this psalm uh, actually is referring to later on, he refers to the time that the children of Israel were going through the Red Sea and the enemies, their enemies, uh, the Egyptian army, uh, they were left in the Red Sea. They couldn't uh, leave the Red Sea. They were drowned in the Red Sea. So God had uh, shown by his power uh, the enemies were fallen because God had protected his people and brought them out of Egypt and through the Red Sea. And so <clears throat> God is the almighty God. He can use uh, such a, his, his creation. He can use the creation that he has made to, to bring honor uh, or to bring the people of God to understand who he is and what he can do. He's the almighty God. He has all of this in his hand. It's all in his hand. So his works are the best of all. If you take and you compare it to mankind's works, you know, mm, I could say the best, for example, the best writing that was ever written by any man compared to the word of God, the word of God is so much greater. His works are the best of all. Mankind's works, you know, come up to, very short to God's works. For example, the Bible says that his ways are higher than our ways or, you know, in comparing his thoughts, his ways, 
They're so much higher than our ways. The same thing, his works are greater than our works. We're, our works, we try our best. We try our best. And if we do our best and we do the, the best that we have ever done or the person in the world that has, you know, has done better than anyone else in the world. But God's works are much better than those, are much higher and greater than those. I mean, look at what God did in the creation about, uh, you know, uh, uh, creating the mountains and the seas and all of that. The trees, the people, people. <laughs> he did it all, and it was so beautiful. And, and God Himself even said it was good. And He said when He created man that it was very good. So His works are the best of all. There are no other works in all the universe that are better than the works of God. I mean, look at the the, the great suns, the galaxy, the the, uh, the universe itself. It's such a wonderful, amazing thing. No, who, who in the world can do that? Nobody. But God, he's powerful. He's almighty. He, his works are glorious. So he deserves the praise. He deserves the praise for the, his creation. He deserves the praise for what he did in coming here and, and making himself a man and dying on the cross <laughs> for humanity. I mean, suffering that pain and that, that, uh, that mockery and that, uh, I mean, just... And then receiving it in such a way that it was the utmost pain that anyone could ever receive. And he, he Isaiah says that his his form or his visage was not that of a man. It was so, so changed because of the suffering that he had gone through. Yet it was, one could say, the work of God. It was God's work. It was beautiful. Although when you look at him and you see what happened to him, it looks ugly. But actually, that was for the purpose of forgiving mankind of his wicked acts, of his iniquity, of his sins. And so then Jesus Christ forgave us. And then he was one that did that work in order so that we could have rest. We could have peace. We could have our forgiveness of our sins and we can have received the Holy Spirit. We can be free. Amen. Though his works are the best. There's no one better. No one can do better than his, his works. So God makes the best works of all. There is no comparison and no comparison at all. No matter what, what person, no matter what thing, there's no comparison between the, the works of man and the works of God. Even though mankind can do wonders with their works today because of advanced machinery, we have high technology and all of this, no matter what scale it reaches up to better, better works than in the past, it will never reach to where, to what God can do or what, you know, comparison, man and God, God's is better. Hallelujah. Much higher than the works of man. Praise God. That which came from God is above all. Furthermore, it is nothing for God to go ahead and have the enemies of the Lord be brought down or submit unto his power. I mean, he can do it. It's very easy for him to do it. I mean, he just, whatever, he, I mean, he just has so many ways to put his enemies under, under or submit to his power. Because God is all powerful. He knows everything beforehand he knows all the plans so it's there is for him there's no challenger it's it's really easy what kind of works does god do even today he does you know all kinds of miracles but one knows that god is the creator that you know he created everything in the beginning that he made those things which are in the earth as well. He created the, the heavens, the suns, the stars. And then he created things on the earth. He created even the beasts and the, 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 the flowers and the trees and the animals and the uh, uh, birds and mankind. Yet, what does God do today? Even after the creation, after thousands of years have passed, God still does mighty miracles, which for him is obviously really simple. There's nothing complex about God's work. In other words, it's not easy. It's not difficult for him to do a miracle. It, it, it is really easy for him. For us to study his creation, that is a, 
complex thing, one could say. But uh, for him, it's not. It's simple because he is all knowing. He's all powerful, and he's omniscient too. He know he knows everything. Amen. All knowing. That's what I said. Omniscient. He is all powerful, and he is omnipresent too. Amen. Praise the Lord. So here, uh, it is simple to God because he is that kind of God. When one looks for a miracle, God can do it even better than we can even imagine it. Sometimes we, we're looking for a miracle. Sometimes we're saying, God, you've got to intervene in this situation. And he, he may even do it better than we had never expected, even thought about. His ways are higher than our ways. His answers are better than what we have asked for. The reason is because God, he can take the supernatural and does something something powerful. Amen. With the supernatural, he can, you know, pull strings. Like, you know, the natural is like the natural is everything that normal that happens in life, but he he is the God that does things supernaturally so he can pull strings. He can, you know, he can work any way he wants to work like that. Amen. Then there is the faith of mankind that pleases God because of those things that mankind does to serve Jesus Christ. Amen. Of course, he's not going to go against his word. So, uh, yes, all things are possible for God, but he doesn't go against his word. He does things uh, sometimes for the people of you know, people to see, you know, who he is and to recognize, you know, what a beautiful God he is and what he has done for man. That is, you know, in the word of God, how that he showed his love by coming into this life as a human being and suffering and dying for mankind. Verse four says, all the earth shall worship thee and shall sing unto thee. They shall sing to thy name, Selah. No doubt this is a prophecy of the time period when all the earth's people will worship and sing to the name of Jesus Christ. At present, of course, mankind is not cognizant totally of who Jesus Christ really is. Yet, when he comes back to the earth and reigns over all the countries of the world as the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, then, of course, there will be a change, a radical change that the earth today does not really understand. The radical changes that have to take place is the advancement of worshiping Jesus Christ from every country of the world and so many other places that it, it includes all. It says here, you know, that... <clears throat> Praise God, we just read it here. Uh, how terrible art thou in the works through the greatness of thy power, thy enemies submit themselves unto thee. All the earth shall worship thee and shall sing unto thee. All the earth, every person. So, <laughs> of course, at present, mankind is not cognizant totally of who Jesus Christ is. Therefore, you know, people don't know him. Yet, when he comes back to this earth and reigns over all the countries of the world, as the Lord of Lords and as the King of Kings, then, of course, there would be a radical, radical change. And that a lot of people today do not understand what, what kind of change is going to take place. The radical changes that have to take place is obviously the advancement of worshiping Jesus Christ from every country and so many, in, in so many other places. It includes all. There will be a must for such large facilities to hold many, many more people that are that will be worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, here it says, all the earth shall worship thee. Then, you know, they could do it outside, but when, uh, you know, let's say that the weather gets bad, well, they need uh, facilities that are humongous. So the stadiums that are of today, obviously, hold thousands upon thousands of people. And it could be up to mm, about 150,000 or so, as far as I understand. The biggest stadium that I know of is in North Korea. But you take in consideration that facility, or the biggest one that there is on the earth, that is going to be, you know, small in comparison to what it will, what, what they'll be able to make 
and the praises that will go unto God from many more thousands of people. Because, the Bible says, all the earth shall worship thee. In other words, God himself. And shall sing unto thee. So, hey, look at this. What God will do. So there, there are some who get excited and they love to go to the games to watch players and roars of the crowd go up. But here, you know, we're talking, yes, thousands of people, but, but the crowd that will come together in the time period that they begin to worship Jesus Christ, when it says all the earth shall worship him or thee, that means that, you know, if we take the biggest crowd that has ever gathered for the purpose of, you know, shouting or just having a good time or whatever, one uh, a soccer game match, one football game match, or whatever it is for for this time period, what this Bible verse says, all the earth shall worship thee and shall sing unto thee, there's, gonna, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. Because here today we have the population of the United States rising, rising. I mean, population around the world is rising, 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 rising. More and more people throughout the world. And so here, when it says, all the earth shall worship thee and shall sing unto thee, we're talking about a number that is just... <laughs> beyond belief that are going to be worshiping God. So that means that there's not going to be anything like it. It is going to be so wonderful, so glorious. And, and that, that, I think, that is the whole purpose of this particular verse, is that Jesus Christ wants more praise coming to him that has, that in comparing it to any other time period, any other thing, any other activity, Jesus Christ wants more praise than, than any other thing that has happened on this earth. If there has been a great gathering of people, millions of people, you know, shouting or whatever about this certain thing, that certain thing, this day, it says, all the earth shall worship thee and shall sing unto thee. Hey, it will be more glorious. It will be more beautiful. It will be more powerful than any other thing throughout the history of mankind. This day of all the people around the world gathered for the purpose of praising him and singing unto him. It's going to be amazing. Praise God. So there's going to be nothing in that can compare to it. Absolutely nothing. However, in view of this scripture, the crowds that will come to worship him will make the crowds of people who came to watch soccer or some other football game or some other event to shame. It will, it will be just to shame. It's, it's very, very little in comparison to what this verse is saying will happen one day. The, grow, the earth's population obviously is growing. In the past, the population was far fewer than today. And in fact, if one thinks about the time, let's say, for example, let's take the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, which is a period of a thousand years. <laughs> All the, the children that will be born during that time, I mean, families can probably have, um, you know, uh, a lot of children, and it's going to be a, a you know a time where there's probably going to be a baby boom. I mean, a big baby boom, because people are out to help one another. People are out to love one another, and, and there's not going to be the the the, the, the fighting and the, the the corruption and and the this that and the other and so uh, the things you know the the murders and all of that. That's not going to be. A, it's going to be a time of peace and safety that uh, you know. People today talk about peace and safety, but that time period is going to be so, I mean, you can open up the door. You don't even have to have a lock on the door. Uh, what do you need a key for? Everybody's safe. <laughs> so, so that period of time, the earth is going to grow in so, uh, so, uh, such a population boom. You know, it's going to be amazing. One 1,000 years of this population boom with safety and security and, and uh, love and, and peace and, and, and no need for, for you know, worrying about if something's going to get stolen, somebody's going to get hurt because of, the, because of somebody else trying to go after them. None of that's going to happen. It's going to be such a glorious time, period. 
And then all of these people will be going to worship the Lord. All the earth shall worship him. And that's just going to be a marvelous time. So in the past, the population was far fewer than today. Today, the earth's population shows substantial growth, obviously. Yet the growth that will happen as a result of, you know, this scripture being fulfilled, for example, all the earth shall worship thee. Hey, that's going to be the, no doubt, the most population that has been on the earth. And, of course, the most praise that comes. So every, anything that you know, comes in, you know, comparing this and th to that, there's no comparison. That day is going to be much greater in praise and worship to God, to Jesus Christ. And that's going to be a wonderful thing to be a part of, to see, to, to, to hear, to, you know, just to see. Uh, it's just going to be amazing. And the blessings of, the, of God that will flow because of that. Amen. So, the growth of the population in that time period will be uh, a lot more. It will emerge more and more. It will come to a point that the scripture being fulfilled will be so large in number that will probably shock anyone that would be able to see it occur. It would just shock one person's mind and he'll think, wow, that is awesome. I mean, just one, wow, that is nothing like it. God, he does things that are, Higher, better, he does, he's the best. In all the, all the um, rulers or governors or presidents or kings or any kind of ruler during the time that they ruled the earth, you know, there is nothing in comparison to when God takes over. When God has total reign on earth. When Jesus Christ, you know, returns and he begins to reign. His reign will be so much better, so much higher, so much more glorious, so much, oh, mankind, if they could see what God does. <laughs> you know, I mean, look at what he did already with the, the creation. Look at the things that he did already with the creation. And to compare it, you know, to, to mankind ruling and reigning or uh, 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 mankind um, trying to do this and the other. Let God do it. Hey, God is God is better than we are. When God, when Jesus Christ comes back and he reigns, hey, he will do things so much better than uh, any other time period in this life. And the population is going to be growing rapidly. And it's not going to be the thought of, oh, there's an overpopulation. What can we do? No, it's going to be so glorious because God, Who's in charge? <laughs> Who's in charge? Amen. So here it says, uh, come and see the works of God. He is terrible in his doing toward the children of men. So now that, of course, King James Version sounds like, oh, that's a negative thing. God is doing bad things to people. But actually, this is actually referring to, hey, he is wonderful in his doing toward the children of men. He is he is awesome. He is beautiful. He is He's doing these things that are, wow, amazing. So there is an invitation that is being sent out. The invitation is for all the people to, all of them, to see the works of God. Obviously, uh, people, you know, can you know, look and see from his creation the works of God in that way to actually see it with their eyes. But let's go ahead and see what the context is also. Of course, then we look at the next verse. In the next verse, we'll just go ahead and read that verse too. And it says, He turned the sea into dry land. They went through the flood on foot. There did we rejoice in him. Now, uh, by when this psalmist had written this particular verse, <laughs> the Red Sea was not being opened, or it wasn't a, at the present time that he was writing it that he actually saw the Red Sea being opened and then walking across on dry land. So what does that really mean then to actually see the works of God in the context that he was saying? It's saying actually to go ahead and read it and imagine it in your mind how that God, because one reads it in, in, um, in, in um, Exodus, 
reads it in Exodus, and he finds the person can actually visualize it in his mind, that wonderful work that God was did for the people of Israel to open the Red Sea, you know, put walls up and have them walk. I mean, how in the world? Well, that's something supernatural. And so people can read it and imagine it in their mind, the wonderful, amazing works that he had done. But he also does things today, too. So the invitation is for people to see it. In other words, read about it. Read it in the Word of God. The next verse gives that idea that people can actually read it and imagine it from the Word of God. So it's encouraging people also to read the Bible. It's, it's saying, come see the works of God, but it's also encouraging people to read the Word of God. Hallelujah. But I mean, in standing, for example, this verse, standing alone, come and see the works of God. Well, hey, there are things that people can see. If you come to the place, for example, where people gather together and worship God, hey, people can see that there are things that God does. Even when people pray and seek out God, there are things that God does that people can see. Hey, it's real. He's real. Amen. Since the writing of the psalm would be after the Red Sea opened for the people of Israel to walk on dry land, one needs to uh, question, how can a person see it literally then? To see it is actually then a call excuse me, to read about what God did in the Word of God and have a glimpse of it in one's mind, like a, a visualizing it to visualize it, one would have to bring forth that picture while reading of that which had happened to the Egyptian army. Thus, there is a call for people to read about it and see it within their minds. Therefore, it is not just a call for people to visualize it, but it is also a call to read the Word of God and have them come across that miracle in the Word of God and what he did to the Egyptian army. But, uh, of course, Psalms, when was it written? It was written before Jesus Christ had come into this life. So one could think about that and say, well, hey, the works that Jesus Christ did, the works of God, the wonderful works of God, <laughs> when he came, he did wonderful things too. Thus, being the case, this being the case, then one realizes that it is a call for all people then to read the Word of God concerning the miracles that he had done for his people. And of course, one comes to the New Testament, he comes to the time when Jesus walked on the earth and had done miracle after a miracle. This then is a call then to visualize what had taken place in the ministry of Jesus Christ by him healing the blind eyes, by raising the dead, by healing that person who was paralyzed and those people that had uh, leprosy and all of these kinds of miracles that Jesus Christ had done and see the wonderful works that he had. He had power over nature to calm the storm, to bring forth fish, to come into the net so that the disciples could have an abundance of fish. I mean, his to see those works of God, that is the call to read it and then glorify God. Give God the glory for what uh, he had done. Amen. Come and see the works of God. He is terrible in his doing toward the children of men. He is awesome. What he does is just awesome. So, to visualize it, when, what takes place in his ministry, to see it and to value it. We should value it highly. For the word here has a call to mankind, those who love God or come to know him, to read it, to visualize it, to go to the miracles that were done that exalt Jesus Christ. It is a call then to read about the miracles that Jesus Christ had done for mankind. For there should be no doubt that Jesus Christ did so many miracles and those that pointed people to the miracles that he did, giving honor to God himself. If one searches in the Bible for those miracles, one goes to the stories of Jesus Christ and finds an abundance of the works of God that he had done for the people, for his people, for people that 
may not have known him. And so there's a call to read those miracles and visualize it in their minds, to see them in their minds, that Jesus, what Jesus Christ did for people. These really do exalt him overall and give him that position of, hey, he, he needs 100%. And so verse number six says, he turned the sea into dry land. They went through the flood on foot. There did we rejoice in him. So he's talking about the time period of the children of Israel going, you know, through the Red Sea. And then the Egyptian army actually came after them, but the Egyptian army was drowned and they were safe. So that is, in a sense is like a person who is baptized in Jesus name. And they are baptized in Jesus' name, and all the sin, all the sins from the past that they had done do not come out on the other side. They come up out of the water, and they are clean. Their conscience is clean, so no longer do they have those sins there. They're not able to cross to the other side. Amen. So a man is free. And that, that's, that is a wonderful work of God because that offers forgiveness of their sins. And the only way that... Uh, an a person that comes to Christi come into Christianity to be born of water is to go through that experience of being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins according to Acts chapter 2, verse number 38, that which Peter said on the day of Pentecost. So, hallelujah. But here, <clears throat> in looking at verse number 6, the Israelites or Hebrews, as they were called at that time, were firsthand witnesses of his power and how God delivered them from the Egyptians by opening up the Red Sea, having them walk on dry ground for the, through the midst of the Red Sea, realizing how beautiful God was working for them. And so he was doing just an amazing work. I mean, awesome work. I mean, that's, that's really uh, the, the idea you know, King James says how terrible, but he, this is actually amazing. One could say that those miracles that God did for Israel as a nation apart from the Egyptians were bringing glory to God. In verse 5, in not just taking this in context, but in broadening one's viewpoint to see the works of God that he has done in other parts of the word of God is so beautiful as well. Hallelujah. That is, from the time of the writing, Jesus Christ... From the time of this writing in the Psalms, Jesus Christ had not yet been born. Further, the one writing this did not realize all of the miracles that Jesus Christ would do in his lifetime. So Jesus Christ was going to do many works, wonderful works for people. Hallelujah. So now we can read it and we can say, hey, the time of Jesus, hey, he did many wonderful works. And, it, and we can just visualize it and give glory and honor to God for what he had done. So to see the works of God, one should also be looking at the life of Jesus Christ, how he had delivered people from sickness, disease, from physical ailments that were not able to be changed by doctors. The, the doctors could do nothing, but Jesus can do it. So those who had leprosy, those who were paralyzed, or those who, you know, suffer... I'm sorry, who were blind. Even those who had recently died and Jesus Christ had brought them back to life. Amen. So these are those kind of things that the writer may not have had in mind. But in reading them today, one realizes that the works of God are even greater today by looking at the life of Jesus Christ and what he had done for mankind in Israel. Yet even more greater works, one can say, was the fact that when Jesus Christ had died, he had given his life, and then he rose from the dead, he had set it up in heaven, the Holy Spirit came down. He poured out his Spirit upon mankind. For the reason, why, why was he able to do this? Is because of the price that he paid with his blood upon uh, Calvary. In other words, on the cross, he died, he gave his life. So he died on the cross for all of humanity so that hum all of humanity can, can have salvation. That was the actual physical act of Jesus Christ by being beaten, by being bloodied, by dying on the cross. And he was pierced for the transgressions of humanity. Then 
He resurrected from the dead on the third day. He ascended up into heaven. These kinds of powerful works that he had done, bringing forth the Spirit of God into mankind on the day of Pentecost to start the church age. Huh. Is that what should be entitled in the King James form of English? Terrible works. But actually, these are that, that which means awesome, wonderful, powerful, glorious. Oh, just, I mean, amazing. It's the modern day thought of tremendously awesome works that God had done for humanity to bring salvation to mankind. These to save mankind are the most glorious works of God. I mean, to make the world, to make, uh, you know, the stars, to make humanity. All of these things are good, very good. But to save mankind, that's even greater work of God, to save mankind, to offer it to all humanity. So these are which we should rejoice in him more than ever before. One should read about them to get the understanding of the power of God's love for mankind and what God had done for mankind to provide to him, to provide to us salvation, the message of salvation, the power of the Holy Spirit, and forgiveness that is available through the blood of Jesus Christ. These glorious and awesome works of God are that which one could say the writer here encourages mankind to read about or see or visualize in one's thoughts. Amen. Thus, mankind is encouraged to read about his works that he had done that were glorious, that were amazing, that were quote-unquote terrible, but that means awesome. Verse 7, he says, He ruleth by his power forever. His eyes behold the nations. Let not the rebellious exalt themselves, Selah. O bless our God, ye people, and make the voice of his praise to be heard, which holdeth our soul in life, and suffereth not our feet to be moved. For thou, O God, hast proved us, thou hast tried us as silver is tried. Here the writer of the psalm states that God ruleth by his power forever. Jesus Christ has stated that all power in heaven and earth was given unto him. Therefore, Jesus Christ rules. He as God as God, he does behold the nations. He looks at them. He watches them. Amen. But he cares for us. He cares for his people. One could say that the Egyptian Pharaoh was the one who was requested by God to let the children of Israel go in a very gentleman manner. Hmm. Please let, let my people go. Yet, Pharaoh was stubborn. He was one could say, rebellious and not allowing them to go. He just had a hard heart. He said no. The second part of verse 7 states that the rebellious should not exalt themselves. Surely in being rebellious at the, against the hand of God in it, it brought the, the country of Egypt to its knees, actually. That rebellion in the heart of Pharaoh turned the tables for the children of Israel to become well-known in the world, have a good testimony. In other words, they people... Uh, around the world would hear about the God of Israel because of the wonderful works that God had done for them. And that the Egyptian army that was probably the most powerful army at that time was brought to its knees because of the God that the Hebrews had served. So the tables were turned. They had suffered a lot of beatings, a lot of hum humiliation by the hands of those taskmasters, but God turned around that quote-unquote hardship and brought it to the Egyptians instead, and God saved his people by bringing them through the Red Sea and over on the other side, and the Egyptian army was lost. They died in the Red Sea. So that re rebellion in the heart of Pharaoh was actually what brought uh, Egypt to a point that they were no longer uh, a powerful nation anymore. They turned the tables, and uh, Israel then became their own nation. And they could go and serve God in, a, in freedom. Hallelujah. 
So let's read uh, 11 to 20. It says, Thou broughtest us into the net. Thou laidest affliction upon our loins. Thou hast caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, but thou broughtest us out into a wealthy place. I will go into thy house with burnt offerings. I will pay thee my vows, which my lips have uttered, and my mouth have spoken when I was in trouble. I will offer unto thee burnt sacrifices of fatlings with the incense of rams. I will offer bullocks with goats, Selah. Come and hear, all ye that fear God, and I will declare what he hath done for my soul. I cried unto him with my mouth, and he was extolled with my tongue. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. But verily God hath heard me. He hath attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, which hath not turned away my prayer, nor his mercy from me. So verse 13 and 16, I would like to talk about just a little bit here. That is, the one who has vowed should do that which he had vowed. It is in going to the house of the Lord with a sacrifice unto him. That kind of uh, goes along with what he was saying at the beginning of this particular psalm. Make his praise glorious. It's kind of like a sacrifice. Make his praise glorious. So when uh, the people of God go to the house of God, hey, make it glorious. And so here he says, I will go into thy house with burnt offerings. I will pray thee my vows. It's like, hey, it's time to worship God. It's time to give one's all. And one could also look at verse number 16 and note that God does many special wonders for mankind. One is able to testify what God has done for them. Come and hear. <laughs> All ye that fear God, and I will declare what he hath done for my soul. So it's an individual thing. What God has done for me. Now there's a, what God has done for the nation of Israel. What God has done for, you know, people when Jesus was alive. And then after that, the apostles receiving the Holy Spirit and 120. And then, you know, throughout the nations, what God has done for people. How that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Also, that is a, you know... It can testify, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and uh, ye shall be witnesses unto me in Samaria, in Jerusalem, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. He, they will witness. Amen? They become witnesses. So, present-day people who have experienced the works of God in their lives, they can be commented about. They can testify to others about how God is awesome, even today, in many ways, God has. And so his, the testi testifying about his wonderful works has become more common today than at any other time. And certainly, certainly, when we read that scripture where it says, all the earth shall worship thee and shall sing unto thee. They're going to have a, a you know, a wonderful um, testimony about what God has done for them. Amen. I mean, it's and and and, and it just goes around the world. All the people that are praising and singing, praising unto Him. Uh, people, they also have a testimony. They also have, you know, the good news and. Uh, Instead of hearing any bad news, everything is going to be good news and peace and wonderful comfort throughout the world. It's going to be a time that, you know, uh, no one has ever seen. But we can read about it. We can try to visualize it. We can see it in that way. But, I mean, it's going to be just a glorious time. Amen. Praise God. Lord bless you.